Okay, well, I mean, I didn't really decide to become a musician until I got into high school. And then I got deadly serious. Um, uh, I played a little bit of piano when I was a kid and some trumpet. Mm -hmm. um, learned how to read music playing trumpet. But then uh, I stopped and didn't start again until I got into high school. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I picked up the saxophone and the flute and the yeah. clarinet in high school. So basically, when I became a musician, I was a saxophonist and my focus was on jazz music. I was very into jazz music. Mm -hmm. And... But, uh, you know, I grew up in an interesting area. I was born and raised in Marin County, California, mm -hmm. uh, which is just north of San Francisco. It's right across from the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And at, the, and at that time, in the 60s and early 70s, there was a lot of musical activity. Bands like Sly and the Family Stone, The Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, mm -hmm. plus all these old blues guys who I was really into. I was really into, like, Muddy Waters and, you know... Uh, Big Mom and Nate Thornton, people like that, you know, and so I was really into that kind of music too, and I would see them in small clubs, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I got exposed to some of the jazz greats through uh, older friends of, of mine, like people like Ross on Roland Kirk and Cannonball Adderley, Miles Davis, I saw those people live, you know, so, I mean, I, I continued that uh, pretty much continuously. The other thing about Marin County was in 1966, uh, one of India's greatest musicians moved to my hometown in uh, San Anselmo, California and started a, a school of North Indian classical music there. Uh, his name was Ali Akbar Khan. Yeah, I mean, you, you, I don't know if you're familiar with Ali Akbar Khan. Most people know Ravi Shankar. He taught George Harrison sitar. So, I mean, oh, because cool. the Beatles were into that music, all of a sudden that music became very popular. And all of a sudden that school picked up and, and there were lots of students. And uh, I kind of grew up down the street. So that was neighborhood music for me. So I was also deeply into uh, Indian music just by chance and geographic location. And uh, I later entered that school and, and started studying the percussion and vocal music of that music. And I still do all of that stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm a professional musician. I'm, I'm a professional music educator, um, among other things, you know. Like. So anyway, that's what got me to Japan, you know. Uh, I had been living, uh, I had left America. I was living in Mexico, uh, learning Spanish and just kind of, taking it easy in Mexico for a minute um, and I got a job offer to go to, to Japan to teach English and uh, my dream had been to go to India because I'd been studying the music of India for many years but had never been able to get it together mm -hmm. financially to go there and so I was offered this is at the boom there, there was a bubble period in Japan from the early 80s up through the early 90s and you could just walk in as a foreigner and get work you know mm -hmm. so I, I walked into Japan with work already set up for me. Musical and, work? Uh, no, I, w I was teaching English. One of the students at right, the school right. at, at the Alepa College of Music was uh, living in Japan and he wanted to come and study at the school, mm -hmm. but he didn't want to lose all his English students. So I went and taught his English students for six months while he studied music. And I made enough money to go to India. And um, so I did that. I, I taught for six months in Japan, went to India, but I had such a good time in Japan and was so interested in the country that after India, I ended up back in Japan and, you know, there was still work there because the bubble economy was still happening. Uh, you yeah, you can, you can download. Uh, I, I, I recorded maybe six or seven CDs mm -hmm. in, in the time I was in Japan, the 20 years I was in Japan. Uh, I had my own group, you know, a group that I did my own original music um, everybody in the group you know composed and wrote for that group so it was kind of a collective group called Tato Pani it's mm -hmm. a Nepali word for hot spring and okay. uh, I, I had written a song called Tato Pani when I was in Nepal and you know we didn't have a name for the band and you know they liked the sound of that that um, word so we just called ourselves Tato Pani we put out three CDs with that group uh, and you can find those online I think uh, and then another group I was playing with was a, a, a collective uh, featuring a shakuhachi player friend of mine. You know, I was more of a sideman in that group, but, you know, I, I contributed some songs to it. And, you know, definitely everybody was, uh, you know, in, involved in creating that music. And that was called K Tokyo Candela, Candela Tokyo. 
and uh, that's a good group too. So uh, between those two groups, there's six CDs floating around somewhere if you can find them. Exactly. I mean, that's how I got into voice work, actually. Um, mm -hmm. I was studying Japanese kind of privately on my own under a cultural visa. It's kind of hard to, to stay in Japan long term if you don't mm -hmm. have a certain kind of visa. Yeah. So I was there on a cultural visa for three years. And after three years, you know, you don't learn Japanese in three years. So they said, well, either go to university or we're going to kick you out of the country. So <laughs> I ended up going to a university there in Tokyo. And... Um, that's where I got into voice work. Uh, my last year at the university, one of my professors offered me, just suggested, you know, do you want to do this voice job, this voiceover job? And I'd never done any voiceovers or thought about it at all. One of my musical friends was doing it, but I didn't know anything about it. Right? When you do voice work in Japan, that's kind of an important um, thing, to, a skill to have. You have to be able to communicate with the producers and, you know, and, and figure out what their what they want, right? And uh, if you don't speak Japanese, that can be difficult. So, you know, I was able to understand them, even if they were speaking to me in English. They turn to each other in Japanese and go, "Yeah, we kind of. I'm looking for something a little more gravelly or a little bit more, you know, emotional or something." And, and then he turned to me and tried to express that not very well sometimes in English, but I knew what he wanted, right? But anyway, so this guy offered me this job, and so. Uh, I did it, and I said, wow, that's very easy work, it's well suited for me, I have a good voice for it, and uh, so I called up my musical friend and said, hey man, you've been holding out on me, you know, give me your contacts, you know, I was like, and so I, I made a demo tape and passed it around to all the different agencies and started getting work. I never really intended to go into voice work at all. I had never thought about it at all. Um, you know, I had been a vocalist and had studied vocal music, mm -hmm. both Western, classical, uh, you know, some jazz vocal and, and Indian classical vocal. So, you know, I was a trained vocalist, but I just wasn't aware of the world of voiceovers. You know, I stopped watching television in 1972. Uh, I've never played a video game in my life. Um, I just wasn't involved in that world at all. You know? uh, not really. I mean, I, I'm basically unaware of almost everything I've ever done. You know, mm -hmm. um, it, it's weird. You know, like when when you do a voiceover job for, say, a video game or something, a lot of times you're not involved with the final product at all. Um, they send you a script sometimes or sometimes you just receive a script when you show up at the studio and uh, in the script someone has worked out all the parts that they need to record and then you do like four takes of each line giving different emotional um, responses or something like that so that they can use whatever works best for them when they finally put it all together. Right. And you kind of read down a list, so you don't even know what the story is about a lot of the times. You're mm -hmm. just reading these lines. And, you know, you try to imagine what's going on with the action as best you can. And, you know, and then at the end of reading all of these random lines that are completely disconnected, mm -hmm. then they'll say, okay, now we need some damage. You know, uh -huh. so you go, Ugh! or, you know, <laughs> could you die a little bit more painfully? Ah! You know, and you do that for about... 20, 20 minutes or however much they need, and then they go, okay, I think we have enough. And then <laughs> later on, they put it all together, you know? You know, I like Castlevania, I I actually saw it. Some, somebody wrote me an email saying I was, you know, their favorite voice actor or something. Could I have, could they have my autograph? You know, and this is like 10 years after I did the game. I'd never heard of it. So I, by this time I was in America and uh, I just happened to be talking to one of my friends, uh, a younger guy, and uh, I, you know, I knew he was into video games, so I'm going, have you ever heard of this game Castlevania? And uh, he says, oh yeah, that's my favorite game, man. That's what I started out on when I was a kid. And I'm going, oh really? You know, I said, well, apparently I'm this guy Alucard in, in, in the game. You know, you know who that is? He goes, oh wow, you're Alucard. You know, it was hilarious because he'd been mm -hmm. playing it for years and he never knew that I was the guy doing the voice for it, you know. But that was my first introduction to that game, you know. I, I vaguely remember being in the studio doing that voice, but again, it wasn't 
completed as a game when I did the voiceovers. So I never heard the final result. Uh, I, so I went on to YouTube and just saw a little bit of it. So, you know, I've seen, you know, maybe 20 seconds of it. That's about okay. it. Sometimes I did group recordings and sometimes mm -hmm. I didn't. Every time was different, you know. Generally, like Castlevania, I'm sure it was just one day recording. I would think so, you know, two at most. I mean, voice actors charge a, a quite a bit of money to do their job, so they, they try to be as efficient as possible, you know. So you go in there and you just read a whole bunch of lines very quickly and efficiently. That's one reason, as a voice actor, why you get called back. You have to be able to deliver in very concise and accurate way and, you know, just really capture the feeling. And if you're good at that, then, you know, you finish quickly and they like that, right? Well, in Japan, it's different from the United States. I'm, I'm completely uninvolved with voice work in the United States. Um, it's a little harder to break into the scene here. There's a lot more people doing it here. Mm -hmm. uh, in Japan, what happens is there are these independent agencies that shop your demo tape around so you just place your demo tape with various agencies and then when a client is looking for a voice actor mm -hmm. they contact whichever voice uh, agency they like working with and they receive a bunch of demo tapes they listen to them and pick out your voice that's usually how it works and then you get a call saying the client picked your voice can you do it on this day and you say sure and then you just show up at the recording studio. Oh yeah, I mean definitely, I, you know, it's easy work for me, you know, I mean I'm good at it. Uh, I was trained, you know, I mean, I was lucky when I first started doing it. I met one of these guys who'd been in that business for maybe 50 years mm -hmm. and he had been doing voiceovers for all these films, American films that were being brought into Japan for the last 40 years and doing voiceovers, you know, the, the Japanese and the English soundtracks like that. Mm -hmm. And um, so he was really good at telling you how to uh, work inflections in your voice. He'd say, you know, don't drop your voice at the end of the line. Keep up the interest. Don't sound bored, mm -hmm. you know. And, and so he coached me when I first started doing that work and I learned quite a lot from him and uh, because of that you know uh, it's it's a very easy thing you know I'm a trained musician I, I'm a recording artist so I'm used to being in a recording studio so just to walk in without any instrument and just sit down in front of a mic and read lines is really you know it's very easy I have a good voice for it so in that sense you know it's easy work for me and I enjoy it so You know, I consider it, um, certainly, you know, no one has ever offered me that kind of work before. Um, you know, I mean, my interest in video games isn't so great. I don't play them, you know. Um, even when I was doing voice work, uh, I was focusing more on straight narration, you know, just for companies who wanted to do narrations of introducing some kind of product, or I was doing car commercials or radio-type commercials. You know, I mean, certain people really have a gift for character voices, you know. Um, they're able to change their voice. They can do, like, many, many different kinds of characters, you know, just on the fly. I met people like that, just incredibly talented people that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can do that up to a point, but it's really not what I consider my forte. So, you know, I would always, I tended to get called for, like, evil people. I did evil characters because I have a mm -hmm. deep kind of dark sounding voice and mm -hmm. so I'd be doing like these gangster voices or I'd be doing these really big, you know, muscular pro wrestler type guys, you know. It's pretty funny because, you know, I walk into a studio and, you know, I'm this kind of skinny guy and, you know, I'm supposed to be voicing this really big and kind of menacing looking character and mm -hmm. they look at each <laughs> other when I walk in the door and they go, uh, is this okay? And I go, you got a problem, you know. <laughs> Give me my voice, and they go, ah, oh, that you, no problem, no problem. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in an interesting um, 
period in, in my musical development, you know. Um, I moved back to the United States for my daughter's English education about six years ago. You mm -hmm. know, we were in Japan. I wanted her to be bilingual, and she wasn't getting bilingual living in Japan, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we moved back here for her English education, which has worked out really well. Mm -hmm. But when I did that, I decided to make quite a big change in my musical development. You know, I'd been a saxophonist primarily and a percussionist, and uh, I had been thinking about becoming a piano player for years and years, but somehow it had just never happened where I had enough time to just totally focus on that. So mm -hmm. when I moved over here and started completely fresh after 25 years of not living in the United States, I just said, okay, now's the time. And I just started, you know, focusing on piano mostly, but also some percussion. Okay. And um, <clears throat> that's what I do now. So I'm not quite at the point where I'm, you know, ready to play professionally on piano yet, so that's kind of what I'm working toward. Well, I don't even remember, okay. I've come to destroy this castle. 